mighty kangaroo. There's no animal like it in the world. So strange that the first Europeans were tempted to believe it arose from a separate creation. Separate and different, the first white explorers found a land where almost nothing seemed to match their previous experience. Terra Australis, the Great South Land, nearly 4,000 kilometers across, stretching from the tropics to the edge of the Antarctic seas. The very texture of the land seemed alien. Ancient, worn, scoured to its very bones. Craters gouged by exploding meteorites deepened the sense of a harsher world. The endless parched plains seemed hostile to Europeans from a green and gentle land. They searched in vain for familiar plants, and even animals they might recognize took strange and startling forms. Here, the inland rivers run mostly with sand. Water is precious, and a little has to go a long way. Yet it sustains an assortment of life, much of it unique to this greatest of islands. land often parched and ungiving, but also a place of the most startling abundance. In the far north, tropical monsoons flood the heat-baked plains every year, transforming them into rich and productive wetlands, vibrant with life. Almost everywhere, eucalypts dominate the landscape, the unique trees of Australia, masters of drought and fire. Their wispy green crowns shelter colourful parrots. And an even more remarkable creature. The koala and kangaroo truly symbolise the special nature of Australia and led Europeans to question how this island continent came to be so different from the rest of the world. The answer lies in its different origins. Both koala and kangaroo arose from a separate line of evolution, the marsupials, mammals which raise their young in pouches. The story of how the marsupials, and especially their most majestic form, the kangaroos, came to dominate Australia, traces the making of the continent itself and all the extraordinary life it carries.
sea plays a crucial role. Australia is the way it is because it is an island. For millions of years, the encircling sea isolated the great Southland from the rest of the world and kept outside influences at bay. But Australia wasn't always an island. Once it belonged to a primeval lost world. The evidence is exposed by the waves. Embedded in the rock lie fossilized remains of trees that formed part of a worldwide forest 250 million years ago. The trunks and leaves are of primeval trees called Glossopteris. They and their world have long vanished. Identical fossil trees have turned up in Antarctica, South America, Africa and India. They support other evidence, such as the matching shapes of these continents, that they once joined Australia, forming a great supercontinent, Gondwana. This is the shape of Gondwana 150 million years ago, with Australia 3,000 kilometers further south than it is now. Even though it was close to the South Pole, there was no ice because the world was much warmer. Gondwana in Australia was a place of plentiful rain and luxuriant vegetation. There are still places in Australia which recall that lost world. In these mountain streams live remarkable relics other even stranger mammals than marsupials. The platypus is one of only three members of an ancient order to live into the present day. It's a creature so bizarre that zoologists thought the first specimen to reach Europe was a hoax, sewn together from bits of other animals. But oddity is in the eye of the beholder. The platypus is very well designed for its life in the water. It has warm blood, fur and feet webbed for swimming. But the most intriguing feature is that duck-like bill. With eyes, ears and nostrils closed underwater, the bill has become an amazingly sophisticated sense organ. An acutely sensitive shovel that homes in on the minute electric currents emanating from the muscles of worms and grubs hiding in the gravel. The catch is stored in cheek pouches and taken to the surface to be ground up by horny plates and swallowed. The oily, waterproof fur traps the layer of air to insulate the platypus in water that drops close to freezing in winter. Platypuses normally live alone, though several may forage along the same stretch of river. They keep out of each other's way. But come breeding time in early spring, platypuses go courting, and it's the females that take the initiative. The two circle one another, stroking and nuzzling with that most sensitive of organs, the bill. The female has to be careful not to provoke the male, for he has a poisonous spur on each hind leg, though it's a weapon more likely to be wielded against other males. In courtship, touching and petting lead to mutual trust and allow the pair to mate.
They'll mate often in the next few weeks, each encounter accompanied by its ritual of play and caresses. Once she's pregnant, the female retires to a chamber at the end of a burrow that winds into the riverbank for anything up to 30 meters. Here, in a nest of damp leaves, she awaits the arrival of her young. It's the way they reproduce even more than their unusual lives which makes platypuses and their only surviving relatives, the echidnas, such extraordinary mammals. The echidna's ancestry also goes back to the forests of Gondwana. Two kinds survive. This long-beaked one snuffles for worms in the forest litter, sucking them up through its long snout. Its shorter-nosed and even spinier relative has strong claws to break open rotting wood and a long tongue to lick up termites and ants. Females need to stock up on food when the time nears to have their young. Like platypuses, they retire to a burrow. Remarkably, these animals don't give birth to babies like other mammals, but lay eggs. The echidna lays her single egg into a pouch. The embryo is already well developed and hatches in only 10 days. The baby echidna's first move is to find milk, the essential food for all young mammals. But these egg-laying mammals have no nipples. Instead, the baby prods a small patch of skin inside the pouch, stimulating the milk to ooze out through special pores. It might seem a rather messy way to suckle, but the tiny snout sucks up the liquid quite effectively, and the infant increases its weight a hundredfold in the first three weeks. The shapeless bundle soon grows into the likeness of its parent, though still naked. When the spines do grow, the youngster, understandably, is ejected from the pouch. But mother continues to suckle it for another five months. Only then does the young echidna leave the burrow for good. The echidna and platypus are part of Australia's Gondwanan heritage. The rest of their lines vanished, but around 100 million years ago, other mammals appeared whose descendants would come to dominate Australia. Those ancestral mammals looked much like the brush-tailed Fascogale, small beasts with fur and warm blood that enabled them to be active in the cool of the night. The daylight hours belonged to the reptiles, which needed the sun's warmth to function. Most spectacular were the dinosaurs. They ruled Australia for a hundred million years. Most were plant eaters, feeding on ferns and other primitive vegetation.
but great change was about to overtake this primordial world and set the stage for the decline of the reptiles and the rise of the mammals. Gondwana was breaking up. Immense forces shifted continents, reshaped the seas, created new environments. The world's climate changed. There was a gradual cooling around the globe. The ancient forests gave way to a fundamentally different vegetation, the flowering plants. And it led to a fundamental shift in animal life too. By 65 million years ago, the dinosaurs had all but vanished and the mammals were on the march. Flowers offer nectar to attract pollinators, most frequently insects. And they in turn make rich fare for small mammals. As the flowering plants spread, insect life burgeoned and the mammals that fed on them prospered. Some no longer produced eggs, like echidnas and platypuses, but gave birth to babies. One group adopted very short pregnancies. Babies were born only partly formed and completed their development on their mother's nipples. These were the marsupials. From small primitive beasts like these arose a remarkable range of marsupials with diverse ways of feeding and breeding. One feature evolved separately among several marsupial lines, a pouch to enclose and protect the young growing on their nipples. While pregnancy is only short, a mere 12 days among these bandicoots, the young need to be suckled for a relatively long time. It'll be 70 days before they're weaned. Pouches evolved in many different shapes and sizes. Some open forwards, some back. In hunters like this quoll, it's no more than a fold of skin. But the youngsters are firmly clamped to the teats. Their very existence depends on hanging on. They're already lucky to be alive. Their mother gave birth to nearly 30 young, but she has only six nipples, and the others lost out in the race to secure a teat. Later, when they're nearly full grown, the young quolls still cling to mother. They hitch a ride as best they can while she goes hunting through the undergrowth at night. It's a good way of picking up lessons in technique. And there's a meal at the end. Quolls evolved from tiny insect eaters. Their forebears were among the many pouched mammals which spread out to exploit the changing environment of Gondwana. The marsupials reached Australia through the forests that stretched across the supercontinent. Their ancestors probably first emerged somewhere in the Americas. By 50 million years ago, only Australia, Antarctica and South America still clung together. And it's South America that provides important clues to why Australia's marsupials evolved the way they did. The Andes rose long after Gondwana split up, but in their shadow, 
traces of the ancient supercontinent still linger. The great mountains are flanked by forests of southern beech, among the earliest flowering plants, and almost identical to those that survive in Australia. And when night falls, an even more significant link with the past emerges. Domitiops australis is the closest living relative to the ancestor of all Australian marsupials. It's the size of a mouse and feeds on insects, like all that early stock. While Dromesiops' ancestors made their way to the Australian end of Gondwana, other marsupials diversified in the South American section. Among the most successful were the opossums. Around 80 species live on today. Some forage on the ground. Others, like this mouse opossum, roam up in the trees. They're mostly solitary beasts though a glut of food may bring them together. The opossums are skilled at catching insects, and they also relish easily digested plant foods, especially nectar. While the woolly opossum and its relatives harvested a range of foods, their young safe in the pouch, other South American marsupials went on to become specialized flesh eaters. One opossum even took to the water in search of prey. The yapok is the only marsupial ever to adopt an amphibious way of life, the marsupial equivalent of the platypus. The yapok's well equipped for its special existence. The hind feet are webbed to generate swimming power, and the tips of the forepaws are enlarged into sensitive pads to feel for prey. One disadvantage might be the pouch. Water might get in and drown the babies, but that's taken care of too. Fatty secretions around the lip seal it into a watertight chamber. Underwater, those sensitive fingers do their work. The eyes are closed and the yapok finds its food entirely by touch. The yapok returns to the surface to devour its catch of fish and crustaceans. Why none of Australia's marsupials ever adopted this way of life is a mystery. Perhaps the platypus was already too well established. Remarkable as the yapok is, fossil remains reveal that even more extraordinary marsupials once lived here large, ferocious hunters and killers. Some resembled giant otters with large, slashing teeth. Others were dog-like hunters, some the size of bears. The saber-toothed Thylacosmilus and its relatives, perhaps the fiercest of all. Their prey wasn't other marsupials, but another kind of mammal altogether. These exotic marsupial hunters are extinct, but relics of their prey live on. The sloth belongs to that other group of mammals, the so-called eutherians, which nurture their young not in pouches, but inside the mother's body, in wombs. These mammals without pouches, the line to which we ourselves belong, were evolving at the same time as marsupials. While some, like the anteaters, fed on insects, most of the eutherian mammals were plant eaters, and it was their flesh which fed the marsupials.
One group, the primates, became especially adept at harvesting fruit and leaves. They're very social animals, roaming in troops founded on females and their young, and led by strong males. With the strong bonds between mothers and infants and their great agility, South America's primates were very efficient exploiters of their treetop world. But neither their ancestors nor any of the other early Eutherian mammals ever managed to reach the Australian end of Gondwana. That feat was achieved only by the marsupials, and they were well entrenched by the time a major event ensured that the pouched mammals would inherit Australia. 50 million years ago, Australia broke away from Gondwana and drifted north with its founding company of ancestral marsupials. With no eutherian mammals competing for living space, the Australian marsupials evolved into an astounding range of creatures, including a great variety of plant eaters. There were bulky beasts the size of oxen that browsed on shrubs and low trees, the largest marsupials that ever lived. Others had long pendulous trunks to reach higher branches. And with such an abundance of bulky flesh, there were flesh eaters. The largest and most ferocious was Thylacoleo, a killer possum the size of a panther. Other pouched hunters were more wolf-like. The last thylacines were still marauding through the forests of Tasmania until 50 years ago. Unlike the marsupial lions with their swift pounce, the thylacines wore their quarry down in dogged pursuit. Once there was a whole range of these marsupial wolves, as there was of this fearsome looking creature. The Tasmanian Devil is the sole relic of a large company of beasts that fed almost exclusively on carrion. The devils hark back to Australia's golden age of marsupials. Fifteen million years ago, their ancestors feasted on a vast array of marsupial flesh, from bandicoots to the many animals which evolved to feed on plants. The earliest plant eaters lived up in the trees. The ancestors of possums and this spotted cuscus, which still inhabits the northern forests. The cuscuses remain aloft, but some of their distant forebears ventured to the ground. And from those primitive possums emerged the most distinctive marsupial of all, the kangaroo. How the first move out of the trees might have happened is revealed by the brush-tailed possum. It feeds in the canopy, but it also browses on the forest floor. To keep its balance on the branches, it moves with a bounding gait, and here may well be the genesis of the kangaroo hop.
Some of those early venturers stayed on the ground, where bounding proved an effective way of getting around and escaping predators. The musky rat kangaroo represents those first ground dwellers, a living portrait of the founder of the entire kangaroo family. With locomotion delegated largely to the hind legs, the front paws became hands to manipulate plants, fallen fruits and seeds. This tiny kangaroo lives alone. Such nutritious foods are fairly scattered and best collected away from competition. It often buries leftovers, squirreling them away for times when food might run short. But while there were new opportunities on the ground, there were also new dangers, and the early kangaroos like this Rufus Betong learnt to build nests to hide from their enemies. That prehensile tail, so useful for hanging onto branches up in the trees, now made a handy carrier for nesting material. That tail also came to serve as a counterbalance. With stronger hind legs and longer feet, bounding became true hopping. Though betongs are solitary animals, they do need to get together to breed, and they do so very cautiously. Males and females are equal in size and strength, and his attempts to woo her are extremely tentative. His hind leg shields him while he gets his nose close enough to check by her smell whether she's ready to mate. Among these tree kangaroos, males have to compete with each other for mating rights and grow much more powerful than females. The large bucks smear their scent liberally around the terrain. Glands on the chest secrete a forceful chemical message that spells out his size and power, a message that tells other males he's around and not to be tampered with. Males are thrown into conflict more often because these kangaroos live in loose groups and over time, competition tends to lead to greater size. Tree kangaroos are something of an evolutionary oddity. They used to live on the ground, but somewhere in the past they returned to the canopy to take advantage of the abundant leaves there. They've become readapted to life in the treetops, with short, broad feet padded to prevent slipping, and powerful arms with long, sharp claws to grip trunks and branches. Tree kangaroos range throughout the rainforests that once covered Australia. Now they're only found in a few patches in the far north and New Guinea. While these odd creatures remain out on an evolutionary limb of their own, the main stem of the kangaroo family was sent branching in new directions by a dramatic change which overtook Australia 10 to 15 million years ago.
the climate became drier and much of the rainforest gave way to open woods and grasslands. The changes prepared the ground for the rapid expansion of the kangaroos. As well as browsing on the leaves of trees and shrubs, some wallabies began eating the coarser grasses. As they moved into the grasslands, they carried with them the miracle of marsupial birth. That most extraordinary process is signaled by a Tamar wallaby licking her pouch. The birth is only the start of an arduous journey. Before it's even clawed its way free of the membrane, the young responds to gravity and starts heading upwards towards the pouch. not so much to clean a path as to keep the way moist and prevent this tiny creature drying out. That's all the help it gets from its mother. It's only fingertip size, but its forearms and claws are well developed and strong enough to haul its way up through the jungle of its mother's fur. The chest and lungs, too, are already quite large to gulp in vital air on the long climb. Once it reaches the lip of the pouch, it's probably scent that guides the little creature deep inside to one of the four teats. jaws clamp onto the nipple, which then expands inside the mouth, so locking the young firmly onto the teat. Even the composition of the milk changes to match the baby's growing needs, becoming steadily richer in fats and proteins. But there's a grimmer option too. If conditions turn bad, the flow of milk stops and the baby dies so saving the mother's resources. If it goes the full term, this period in the pouch lasts nearly six months. Then the young has its second birth into the world outside. These first excursions are quite brief and the pouch remains home for some months yet. Pouches are put to good advantage in Australia's unpredictable environment. They're convenient baby carriers while parents search for better pastures. With a flexible means of reproduction and an efficient means of travel, the kangaroos were set to advance with the spreading grasslands.
colossal hind legs work rather like efficient springs, and the innards flop up and down, pumping air in and out of the lungs, so saving on muscle effort. With the move from forest browsing to grazing in the open, kangaroos like these eastern greys became more social. Such quantities of easy food take away the need to keep out of each other's way, and there are more eyes to spot danger. As the Australian climate grew drier, grass became more abundant, but it's also hard on the teeth and digestion. Kangaroo teeth grew stronger to grind the tough fibers, and their large stomach acquired special microbes to break them down into easily absorbed nutrients. Many species even developed a kind of cud chewing to help the digestion. They cough up partly chewed food and send it through the stomach once more. Living on the grasslands also led to greater care of the young. The open plain leaves Joey exposed to predatory eyes, especially those of wedge-tailed eagles, and mother holds it back until she's checked that there's no danger. Only when she's sure that it's safe does she relax the pouch muscles to let her baby out. It keeps returning to the pouch, but mother won't let it back in yet. She's teaching Joey to come when she calls. When it obeys, she opens her arms and leans forward so her pouch flops open. Gradually, the spells inside shorten. Grass increasingly replaces milk, and the joey learns to groom and clean itself as it grows to independence. The bond between the young kangaroo and its mother remains strong for a time yet, but she's already given birth again, and the new baby is growing on a teat inside the pouch even while she's still suckling the young at foot. Males are always on the lookout for does that may be in season, ever ready to follow the sexual trail. The bucks try to mate with as many females as they can. But the most powerful male, the King Grey, claims exclusive mating rights, and he's ever alert for a challenge. By scratching her tail, this male interloper finds out if she's receptive. But it's also a very provocative act, not one that the dominant male can afford to ignore. The big buck's approach is enough to deter the interloper. If he's working up courage for a challenge, the time isn't right, just yet. He moves away when the King Grey arrives to assert his rights.
the smell of the doe's urine tells him she's almost ready to mate. But she'll only remain receptive for a few hours, and he covers her with a scent from his chest gland to warn off other males. Again, that inquisitive tail scratching, a kind of foreplay. This time, she remains still, a sign that she's ready for him to mount. Remarkably, the fertilized egg doesn't grow to full term immediately, but stops at the 100 cell stage. It won't resume growing until the present young's about to leave the pouch. Right now, there's a different kind of interruption. The interloper decides that this is the time to launch his challenge. The female makes off. The challenger goes after her. with the king in hot pursuit to reclaim his authority. The king gray paws and rubs at a clump of grass as a warning, a ritualized deployment of scent. Then a show of power, rearing two meters high, mighty arms tipped with sharp claws, an intimidating sight, and normally enough to make rivals turn tail. But this challenger is of equal size and not about to be faced down. Life at the top is precarious and short. King Greys are under constant challenge and defending their status eventually wears them out. The dominant buck looks away, a last attempt to avoid battle. It fails. The aim is to overpower by whatever means it takes. Paws and legs swing into action. The hind claws are sharp enough to disembowel, but in defense, the belly skin's tough like a shield. To minimize injury, the testicles are retracted and the head's thrown back to protect the eyes. A year of fending off rivals has taken the edge off the King Grey's stamina. This time, he may be staring defeat in the face. The raking nails on the hind feet send the fur flying. Each seeks the advantage of higher ground. 
finally, it's the challenger who positions himself for the decisive blow. And that's it. The battle's won. The challenger is king. But for the loser, there's no mercy. He's banished to the poorer feeding grounds. Worn out by the stress of battle, he may well die. Win or lose, such a fight takes a terrible toll. But for the victor, the rewards are great. It's taken him 10 years to reach the top. And although he may reign for only a year, he'll have nearly all the matings and a legacy of numerous young to inherit his winning strength. These titanic battles arose out of the way the lives of kangaroos changed with the nature of Australia. Part of the new pattern that saw these majestic marsupials extend their dominion right into the arid interior. This parched and scoured country is the realm of the largest living marsupials, the red kangaroos. These splendid animals became superbly tuned to the swings between long drought and brief plenty, the triumphant climax of a line that began with a tiny animal chasing insects around the forests of Gondwana a hundred million years ago. The forces that created these unique symbols of Australia also shaped the life of the seas that fringe the continent, the seas under the Tropic of Capricorn. Magnificent book of this series is available at the ABC shop in your capital city and all good bookstores.